Welcome back. I'm here in Galveston where, of course, locals have seen their fair share of hurricanes and major storms from the 1900 storm and 1915 to Carla and Alicia and Ike and even Nicholas took a scrape last year. And the beachfront property is the first line of defense against these storms. In fact, what you see behind me is a house that has been sitting here empty and in ruins since Ike back in 2008, a beachfront property. But the major storms aren't the only problem. If you look out to the water, rising sea levels are eating away at our coastline. Flooding is part of Galveston's history. The 1874 house survived major flooding from the great 1900 storm and Hurricane Ike. Alex Gonzalez and his team have raised and renovated it to become a bed and breakfast. You have to have it a windstorm approved stamp, the roof, the straps, they come and inspect, make sure it can withstand the force winds. People need to realize that uh, when they are um, buying a home in Galveston, they are buying a lifestyle and that lifestyle does come with its challenges. And if you buy a home that's actually on the beach, uh, you do have to contend with the tidal waves during the storms. Monster storms are only part of the problem. Most people, uh, they're aware of, of hurricanes, storm-induced erosion. They don't realize that there is chronic daily erosion moving the coast and lowering the elevation. Take a look at this map of Pirates Beach from 1976. A whole row of buildable beachfront lots no longer exists today, thanks to Hurricane Ike. We have to disclose it as uh, real estate agents that um, you know the Texas can come in and purchase your property if the water line does get too close uh, to your home. Does that happen often? Do you know? We don't see it very often. Uh, you know, during Ike, there was you know a handful that probably lost their home, um, but overall, we don't see that. And there are efforts to save Galveston's beaches, like the Army Corps of Engineers Beach Nourishment Project to replenish Babe's Beach. Every two years, we're dredging the Galveston entrance channel um, and into the Houston Ship Channel. And with that, we do run into some sandy material. So back in 2014 timeframe, USA's partnered with the GLO, uh, the city of Galveston, and the Galveston Parks Board to take that sandy material and beneficially use it to be placed here on Babe's Beach. It's an effort that preserves the beach to boost tourism and recreation. Similar projects are being done all the way down to Padre Island, and studies are underway to look at how to bolster at-risk areas like Pirates Beach and Jamaica Beach. But there's more to consider. A recent study from NOAA indicated that high tide flooding in Galveston will increase dramatically by 2050. High tide flooding or nuisance flooding, the increase of that that we've seen over the, the past years or, or decades even, is tied to changes in our sea level. We will experience more and more nice weather, you know, just high tide flooding events in our streets, whether that's Galveston or surrounding areas. This year, we're projected to see up to 17 high tide flood days in Galveston. In the next 30 years, that number increases to more than 200. So how will the island adapt? Pumping, elevating structures, and increasing storm sewer capacity are all options. There's engineering ways to, to deal with that. What is hard to do is completely prevent it from happening because there's a, a lot larger forces at play. Now we'll go to KPRC2 Investigates Robert Arnold here on the coast where a plan is in the works to protect the shore, support big businesses, and help the environment. This is where the economy is headed. And it's a new economy for agriculture in Texas, for coastal landowners. It's a massive goal. It's part of a new economy of carbon as well as protection of the Texas coast. To create a thousand mile long living shoreline stretching from Orange County to Cameron County. To sustain coastal fisheries, to sustain coastal birds, to sustain all of those things that we as people really enjoy. To Houston environmental attorney Jim Blackburn, it's also a way industry and nature can partner in the fight to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. We want to give companies the opportunity to help reduce their carbon footprint by contributing by buying, if you will, a mile, two miles, 10 miles of this living shoreline. The plan is to protect the Texas coast from erosion and sea level rise, which is eating away vital marshlands. The marshes are the key to the fisheries of the Texas coast. Uh, shrimp, blue crabs, flounder, all use the marsh as a nursery. 
These coastal habitats also naturally siphon tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it in the soil. This is commonly called carbon capture. Environmental scientists believe rising carbon dioxide emissions contribute to global warming. Every acre of marsh has about 400 tons of carbon that's been deposited in the soil. The idea is to deposit rocks or bricks near the coastline, then seed the reefs with oyster spat. Oyster reefs then grow and anchor the structures to the seabed, protecting the shoreline from getting chewed away by wind, waves, and rising sea levels. Lalise Mason runs Scenic Galveston Incorporated and is also with Texas Coastal Exchange, both dedicated to preserving the Texas coast. We are protecting an existing marsh shoreline. Mason already spearheaded a project to protect Virginia Point. Its first and primary function was to protect this undisturbed coastal prairie peninsula. Stone reefs were constructed to protect the shoreline from erosion. Marsh grass was then planted to help keep the carbon stored in the soil from being released. And it develops biomass under the ground, it develops a huge root mass. That biomass in the soil is carbon. That's soil carbon, that's what it is. The entire area is thriving with fish, fowl, and rapidly thickening lines of marsh grass. We try and develop, when we look at a living shoreline, a solution that mimics a natural system. Chris Levitz is the Gulf Coast manager for AECOM and helped design the system now protecting Virginia Point. He and Mason are taking the lessons learned here to work with Blackburn on designing different prototypes that will eventually make up the living shoreline. Do this, but do it almost like on a, you know, a more repeatable, smaller scale. The idea is getting buy-in from one of the largest energy companies in the world. The Valero Energy Corporation is funding the study needed to create a system where industry can help fund construction of the living shoreline in exchange for carbon credits. In the past, we've seen the market in environmental protection kind of being at odds. Today, we're going to see them working together and moving together. KPRC2's Hurricane and Flood Survival Guide is free and online now at clicktohouston.com slash hurricane. It has everything you need to prepare for a storm, including checklists, emergency numbers, and more to help you get your family ready for whatever nature throws our way. Well, when we come back, we're getting into the weeds, or at least digging into the drought, to look at these unusually dry conditions and what kind of impacts they're having on the food we eat and how we live our lives. We'll also look at some creative things that farmers are doing to fight back against these unusually dry conditions. I'm heading back to the studio. You stay with us.